chains were fastened tight down at the jail that night still paul and silas would not be dismayed they said it's time to lift our voice sing praises to the lord let's prove that we will trust him come with me god wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing round you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see, God wants to hear your voice. When the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstance is as hopeless as can be, that's when God wants to hear you sing. loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days when the pleasant times outweigh the bad by far but it's when suffering comes along and we still sing him songs that is when we bless the father's heart god wants to hear your voice when the bride waves crashing round you when the fiery darts surround you when despair is all you see god wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstances as hopeless as can be that's when god wants to hear you sing god wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing round you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see, God wants to hear your voice. When the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstances as hopeless as can be, that's when God wants to hear you say. to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing. <clears throat> All right, going to take your Bibles this morning. If you would go to the book of Matthew, in chapter number five. It's hard to sing in the valley, isn't it? Yes. But it's amazing how much it not only helps us, but how much it praises the Lord when we just keep our eyes on Him, even in those low times. And it's amazing how He can use us even greater sometimes in those valleys when we just open our hearts up and begin to sing. I love that the song there, the basis of it coming from Acts chapter 16 and Paul and Silas after being beaten and being in chains and still open their voices up and praise to the Lord and God comes down and does a wonderful work, starts a church and there it is, we have it in our Bible, a little letter called the book of Philippians. All because some guys decided to start singing in jail one night. You never know what God will do with your circumstances if you'll just keep your eyes on Him and trust Him. Matthew chapter 5, we have been working our way through this chapter here. We've looked at the what is often referred to as the Beatitudes uh, here. And Jesus here, as He is preaching what is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, he is transitioning, if you will, from the Beatitudes to a very pointed challenge to those who are his followers. Uh, we saw this uh, two Sundays ago now, uh, that Jesus here, the last of the Beatitudes is the one that we don't care for. Blessed are those who are persecuted. We'd rather not be in that group if we can keep from it. But God still says, if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, there's a blessing and enduring those things. And that, uh, that oftentimes as we go through the trials of life, when we go through difficulties, it is when our true Christian character shines forth the best. The Beatitudes shows us that genuine inner Christianity is in direct contrast with the rest of the world around us. And we can see this here as we read through that list and we consider what Christ is asking of us and what He is telling us as, as a believer, as one who is a disciple of Jesus Christ, 
uh, to be poor in spirit, to, to mourn, to, to be meek, to uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be a peacemaker, uh, to uh, endure those persecutions and those trials and such. Those are all things that go against what this world says we're supposed to be. But it's what Christ says is going to bring the blessing of God upon us. But it doesn't come through just our own willpower. It is because of what Christ does in each one of us. As our hearts are yielded to Him, He begins to work on us. He begins to mold us. And we begin to see these things appear in our lives. The world we live in does not like the righteous. They don't like folks who live according to these things. They don't like those who are merciful. They don't like those who are pure in heart. They don't like those who, are, uh, who will stand uh, uh, solid for what is right, even though it brings about persecution. The temptation for us is this, is to go and live in a colony away from everybody else and try not to invite scrutiny. That's what we would like. We'd like to all get together. Have you ever thought about this here? Well, we could just find us an island <laughs> and put all of us believers together on a, on a single island. Boy, wouldn't life be grand? No, because you'd be there. <laughs> I would be there. And we'd find some way to mess it up, wouldn't we? Yeah. You know, that's old human nature still there. But as we live in this world, we need to understand God is asking for us to go forth and not be concerned about the consequences You'd rather be concerned about living right and living in such a way that is pleasing to him. After he gives them the truth of persecution, he gives his disciples a twofold illustration of the life they are to live. We're going to look at the first part of that illustration this morning, and then we'll look at the second part next Sunday morning. The first illustration he uses is the idea of salt. Look at verse number 13 with me, if you would. I know we know it well. But here, let's read it together. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Jesus takes a very common item to them in that day uh, to use as an illustration. They would understand salt. In fact, salt was a very precious commodity at that time. It is said that uh, whenever uh, the, uh, the, they would run short on money, instead of doing like our government does and just print some more out, uh, they would actually take salt and that salt would be a replacement uh, for a payment for those believers or for those uh, soldiers that uh, serve in the, uh, in the Roman army. And so salt was very precious. It had a, uh, was a very important uh, thing there. Of course, they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have uh, a lot of the things we have today. Uh, and so salt was used in a lot of different ways. And so Jesus here, he's using this item of salt as an illustration. And as he would say, ye are the salt of the earth. There's a lot of things that would come to their mind, uh, things that they knew that salt was good for. Let me just uh, have us think about this here just for a few moments this morning. First off, they would think of salt as being a preserver. It would be a preserver. Uh, you think about this here. Whenever we have uh, meat or we have uh, something like some dairy item or such like that, uh, we'll take it to the, ha to the house and we'll put it in a refrigerator. Uh, we had some things up in our classroom this morning for Sunday school. And amazingly enough, the chocolate milk did not go. I mean, they, they drank plenty of it, but they didn't drink at all. And so there was a little bit left. And so Brother Terry was trying to capture me before I got to my office to steal my chocolate milk this morning, I think is what he was after. But I put it in that refrigerator to help keep it cold and help preserve it, uh, help keep it from uh, spoiling on me. Uh, you know, they would do that. We do that with meats. But in that day and age, since they didn't have that refrigeration, especially with meats and other food items, uh, they would take salt and they would pack it in salt to help preserve it, to help keep it from uh, going uh, bad on them. Uh, and as we think about that illustration that Christ was giving to them, uh, we think about that in our own way. As, as believers, as Christians, there should be something about our lives that helps to preserve righteousness. Uh, there should be something about us that ever we get into a certain place and we begin to, uh, to be around certain people, uh, there should be something that preserves what is right. If we're living according to uh, Christ's commands and specifically with the Beatitudes in this context, uh, we'll change the environment around us. Let me ask you this. Do others feel they have to act different around you because you're a Christian? 
Do you ever have this happen to you when you're in the workplace? You come walking in and all of a sudden uh, some of the guys standing around the water cooler goes, shh, 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 there, there's, and they put your name in there. Or you're back there working with them and the, uh, so the conversation starts to go a little bit off the tracks and maybe all you do is just kind of look up over at them. They know you're a Christian and so their response to their friend is, I'll tell you about that later. Do you have that effect on people? Do you have that effect because they know you are a Christian? They know that you're a believer? You see, what is going on there is that there is salt going out, and they know what they're doing is wrong. They know it goes against what God says, and they know you're a believer. And so it changes the environment around you. It preserves what is right. It preserves righteousness. Are you a preserver in that way? I like what one man said. He said, we are to preserve and that our godly living retards or pushes back moral decay and wickedness. Now listen, in the home, in the home, on the job, and in the community where we live. Do we find ourselves pushing back against the corruption of the world? Do we find ourselves pushing against uh, all those things that are coming into this world that are anti-Bible and anti-God? And whenever we're around, we're pushing back on that. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. You're the salt. You're going to be the one who helps preserve righteousness just by your testimony. They're going to know you because you're poor in spirit. You're merciful. Uh, you mourn over sin. Hey, do they see that, that you're pure in heart? Do they see you're going to stand for what is right regardless of the consequences? And they see your testimony and they say, boy, that person, uh, they got something about them. And I, I just, I, I feel uh, wrong whenever I do certain things, when I use certain language. I feel like I'm, I, I just feel a little dirtier when I'm around them. That's a preserving effect. Listen, don't apologize for standing for what is right. Don't say, oh, I'm sorry to, if, I, if, I offend, if I've offended you. No, no, no. Don't be sorry for righteousness. Don't be sorry for standing for God. Don't be sorry to be numbered with one of His. Hey, stand there with your head held high knowing, hey, I'm a child of God and I'm supposed to represent my God in every place I'm at, not just in the church house. By the way, that's why they'll say, hey, keep your religion in the church house on Sunday. Why? Because you're bugging them. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Salt is getting in there. It's supposed to be a preserver. The great uh, uh, abolitionist of the 1800s, Henry Ward Beecher, said this. Wickedness goes to great lengths and depths where it is not checked and restrained by the free and continuous expression of the indignation of good men. Hey, don't be afraid to give an angry, uh, uh, have an angry countenance whenever unrighteous is being done in your presence. Hey, take a stand. We're, we're watching our country go uh, uh, just as fall apart. The moral decay uh, that is taking place in this country uh, is it, just, it's just going so fast right now. And it's all because many, uh, many good men have decided to say nothing. There's no more preserving. Ye are the salt. You are going to make the difference. Are you preserving that which is righteous? But not only that, does it preserve, it purifies. It purifies. This day, salt is used as a purifier. Salt placed in a wound that helps to kill off the bacteria that could cause infections. I was doing some reading on this here, and I found this very interesting in the 1600s. The, in the British Navy, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, uh, if a British sailor was, uh, had, had done something wrong or had uh, violated something on the, on the boat, uh, they would oftentimes take him and tie him to the, uh, to the mast and then they would, would whip him, sometimes 20, 30 lashes. And his, body, his back would just be bleeding, have open wounds, and to keep him from getting infection and keep him from having any problems, after they would whip that man, they would take a bucket of seawater and then throw it on his back. Now we all know what that feels like. You ever been to the ocean and maybe you've actually, you had a cut that you didn't know about. It just stings, you know, a little bit there. Can you imagine your back being open from whippings? And then they would take that bucket of seawater. And they said the purpose of doing that was because it would help keep the infect them from, from them getting infected and then having an even graver problem on the boat. Well, what a, what a smart thing to do. 
what a smart thing to do. The, he, he deserved the punishment, give him the punishment, but then let's make sure we don't let him get, you know, we lose him. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a painful thing to go through, but it does the job. It, it pushes those things back. In the Old Testament, salt was to be used in every sacrifice. It was symbolic in this idea here that was purifying what was brought to the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 18, Elijah used salt to purify the bitter water so that the people could drink. And as a Christian, our lives should be purified by the Word of God. And as we are purified in our walk, we then become useful in God's hands to, be, to help purify the world that we live in. Are we a purifier? We should preserve righteousness, but we should also be purifying the world we live in. Do we press back against sin? Do we purify the surroundings? But also this here, salt is a penetrator. I, I know you don't like to hear this, but winter is coming. And it will show up here this last winter. We had some fun over this way, didn't we? I forgot what it was like to live in southeast Missouri when snow fell. You would have thought that the apocalypse was upon us. Uh, living up in the northeast, it's just white stuff that gets in our way. We just keep on blowing through all that stuff. And so I'm, I'm driving around here like I'm in Connecticut still, you know. And, and I'm like, what is wrong with these people around here? Uh, you know, but uh, we had some of that ice that came in along with that snow. And, and so what did we do? We went down to the hardware store to try to find some salt, only to find they were out. Why? Because we know salt does what? It penetrates. It penetrates, it penetrates right through that, uh, that ice. It, it begins to melt it away. We have the, uh, uh, the homemade ice cream makers go, and we got the ice on the outside. We're dumping that rock salt in. Why? Because it's helping to melt down that ice. That's what salt does. That's why we go looking for it as a witness for the Lord. Many times our call to accept the Lord is rebuffed by those around us. And many times it is the consistent Christian life, however, being lived in front of others, that helps to melt the hard heart to be open to the gospel. You may go to somebody and knock on their door and try to tell them about Jesus Christ, but they refuse it. They don't want anything to do with it. And so what do they need to do? They need to see a life lived consistently in front of them. And it's amazing how they watch somebody who does what is right, who does what is right, who does what is right in every aspect of life, even in the smallest of things. He does what is right. How does a great witness. I heard of a man who was working on the job and guys didn't care for his testimony because he was such a goody two-shoes. And so they would try to do things on purpose. They would try to do things to kind of make him angry, but he would never get angry. He would never lose his temper. He just had a sterling testimony. So one day one of the fellows said, I know what I'll do. I'll get him. I'm going to steal his tools. Now, they were required to bring their own tools in to work into the shop there. And, and so one day, uh, while he was about his work, his tools came up missing. He asked around, anybody know what happened to my tools? Anybody know what happened to my tools? And nobody, of course, everybody was in on it. Nobody would say. So the next day, he came to work. He had went out and he had got some more tools because he needed to do his work. He needed to do his job. When he showed up that day to work, he noticed the guy next to him, the guy who was always foul mouth, the guy who was always after him, trying to get him to do what was wrong. There were his tools. And that man purposefully came and he made sure he worked right next to that guy. And he made sure he could see that, that hammer that he used and he, it was very obvious who it belonged to. It, the, uh, from the story that goes, this was the only man who had uh, this certain color of hammer handle and so he knew it was his, but he said not a word. He recognized his screwdrivers. He recognized his wrenches, but he said not a word. And oh, how this guy got so much glee out of doing this and using the stuff in front of him. And he said nothing. All week long, it went like this. And finally, it got to this man. He couldn't stand it because then this guy never said a word. And finally, at the end of the week, he said, he called him out by name. He said, did you not see? Did you not see what I have over here? He goes, those are some fine looking tools you have there. <laughs> he said, but don't, don't you recognize these tools? He said, I surely do. They, those, those look very familiar to me. He said, I stole them from you at the beginning of the week. And you haven't said a single word. Now, why is that? Now, why haven't you said something? Why haven't you got angry? He said, because you must need them more than I need them. 
And instead of responding with hatred and responding with spite towards that man and, and doing those things, he, at, at the end of that week, he was so frustrated and, and he said, What is it? What, why is it? What is it that makes you like the way you are? He said, I told you from the very beginning, I'm a Christian. A man responded by saying, I've never seen a Christian act like you. I've never seen a Christian uh, do things this way. Uh, I, I've been around many Christians, and, and I've, been, I've been told off, and I've had them blow up at me, but you haven't. Why? He said, because I'm a Christian. That man watched him for the next few weeks. The man, by the way, never asked for his tools back. He said, you just keep them. You must need them more than I. And the story goes that for the next few weeks, those words rung in that man's head. You can keep them. You must need them more than I. And finally, after several weeks of watching this man and seeing that not one time would he lose his temper, finally one day he came to him and said, Sir, I need to know how you've got your Christianity. And that man who was so foul-mouthed and who was so bitter and so just antagonistic about everything, after several weeks of watching this man and seeing his testimony at work, he had heard his witness by mouth, but now he's watched it. He said, I need that. And that man trusted Christ as his Savior. That man went on to become a preacher. And that man told that story in every meeting he preached at because he wanted folks to know that your life needs to back up your witness. And when your life backs up your witness, it can win even the hardest of hearts. Why? Because ye are the salt. It penetrates. But also this here, salt not only does it preserve and purify and penetrates, salt promotes. Salt's a promoter. I, we lived up in Trenton, Missouri for uh, four years, and one of the great things about living up in Trenton is that there is a lot of corn and soybean, but especially corn. And I always loved it when we got to about, I don't know, what was it, Heather, about Ju July, I guess. Towards the end of July, all of a sudden, we would start getting some sweet corn to start showing up. Oh, that's good stuff right there. <laughs> Uh, there, there, were, there, were, there were folks in our, in, our, in our church, they would have not just a little patch of, of, you know, I remember Grandpa used to have the garden down here and he'd have like two or three rows. These weren't just two or three rows. We're talking they had acres of sweet corn. Hallelujah. <laughs> and man, we'd get a hold of that, that sweet corn and boy, it was so good. And boy, it, just, it, it was great all by itself. Take just a little bit of salt. And you put a little bit of salt on that thing. Man, it just, it just takes it through the roof. I mean, it is, it, you just, it, it's so good. You want to, you, you, you just, you slap your back of your head just to get to, to get some more of that. And you just love, what, but that salt, what it would do, it would just enhance the flavor. You didn't need to dump, I mean, you didn't put, dump it all out. I mean, you just didn't take the whole bottle and just, you know, throw it out. No, just, just a little bit. But it did a great job of enhancing the flavor. You ever got a hold of, went through the drive through and you ordered fries? What is this wickedness of no salt upon the fries? It is good for nothing other than to be tossed out the window as you're going down the road. Fries without salt is a sin. I don't know what verse that is, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. Listen, fries are worthless without salt. Why? Because it is a promoter. It promotes it. It enhances. It brings about that flavoring about that. Here's what uh, Paul told to Titus in ver chapter 2 and verse 10 of Titus. He says this, Not purloining, but showing all good, fe God, good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Let me ask you this here. How do you make the Word of God look. How many have heard this statement before? You may be the only Bible that some people may ever read. Well, they know you're a Christian, but 
How do you adorn the doctrines of Christ? How do you adorn the doctrines of Christ? Our lives should bring glory to God. Our testimony should not be that it is terrible to be a Christian. People around us should know that it is a wonderful thing to be a Christian. Now we sing the song, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. Now that's not, no, that doesn't tell anybody that's a grand thing. That's a, well, that's a sour thing is what that is. No, there should be some about us that would say, hey, I get to go to church. Hey, I get to read my Bible. I get to pray. I get to live according to the Word. I get to do these things. Hey, I don't find it to be a, a burden upon me to, to serve the Lord. No, I get to serve the Lord. I get to uh, do the things He asked me to do. Oh, I, it is such a privilege. Not once did you hear Paul saying, oh, woe is me. Oh, it's a terrible thing to be a Christian. Oh, he would tell you about the, the trials. He'd go, oh, yeah, there's, there's trials. There's trials, but hey, I'm okay with those trials because God's working in me and I'm excited to suffer for Christ. Why is that disciples would go in and they would beat them and they would beat them and they would beat them? Now don't go, go, don't go out there preaching about Christ, but instead they go out and rejoice saying, thank you, Jesus, I got to suffer for you. What is that all about? Oh, you're promoting the things of Christ, but what is this? craziness we see. What does they have? It must be something worthwhile. It must be something good. Yeah. Are we a promoter? That salt promotes those things. I want you to see this though. I want you to see who he's, he's preaching it to. Look again at verse 13 of Matthew 5. He says this, ye. Ye. We often have this idea that well, what's in the Bible? That's for the preacher to live. Well, what's in the Bible? That's what the deacon is supposed to live. Well, I, I know what the Bible says, but that's for the Sunday school teacher to live. He didn't say that. He said, ye, the disciples, the followers of Christ. Yeah. Now, should the preacher live by those things? Absolutely yes. Why? Because he's a disciple of Christ. Should the deacon live after those things in the Word of God? Absolutely yes. Why? Because he's a disciple of Christ. The Sunday school teacher, should they live after those things? Absolutely yes. Why? Because they're a disciple of Christ. But can I just tell you this here? Uh, the congregation should live after those things that are in the Bible as well. And they should be promoting those things. Why? Because they are supposed to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Are, are, is, the, is the Sunday school student supposed to live after those things? Absolutely yes. Why? Because they are supposed to be disciples of Christ. Jesus here tells his disciples, look, it is you who are supposed to be the salt of the earth. It is up to you to go out and to live those lives. And too often we, we pass it off on everybody else. Well, that person, because they got this title, well, that person, because they have this position, well, that person, because they do this or they do that. And we try to excuse ourselves when Jesus is up here and he's saying, you you are supposed to do it. You're supposed to be living that way. And so the question comes down this way to us. Hey, are you being salty? Are you being salty? Now, I know that term salty can be used in a bad connotation. But in this connotation, it's a good thing. Are you preserving? Are you purifying? Are you penetrating? Are you promoting? You're supposed to be the salt of the earth. But can I just show you one more thing this morning? He gives us a warning. It is possible for salt to become worthless. The potency of salt can be lost. It can become something that does not melt the ice off. It can be something that is, if you pour it into the wound, it does not fight off effect in the infection it can become to such that whenever you sprinkle it upon your food, it does nothing but give grit instead of promoting. If it is not doing these things, the question is this. Jesus says, if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Where are we going to get the purification? Where are we going to get the purifier, the preserver? Where are we going to get the promoter? Uh, he says, here's, the, uh, here's this, uh, the, uh, the, the conclusion of it. It's Thenceforth, good for nothing. Take it and throw it out in the road. Just blend it in with the dirt. 
Just like we're not holding the dirt from the road up as something value, so too salt is worthless if it is not fulfilling its purpose. It's possible for us to lose our effectiveness for Christ and we cease living like a Christian. Our words can cause us to lose our effectiveness. Oh, you can try to be a witness, but you lose your temper one time. You, you begin to uh, curse and to swear, and you find out real quick that suddenly people will never forget those things. We're good at remembering the bad from people. We're not very good at remembering the good. I promise you, you cross somebody one time, you, you, use, uh, you use some kind of uh, off-color language with them one time, one time. They'll always bring you back to that. They'll always bring you back to that. Listen, if we're not careful, our words, you say, well, I, I don't think there was anything wrong with that. Listen, it doesn't matter what you think. Your witness is lost. You know what we've become? Worthless. We're worthless in that person's life. We can't be an effective tool for, for Christ. Our, our actions can cause us to lose our effectiveness. They see us lose our temper. They see us uh, 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 lie and cheat and deceive. And they say, you're no better than us. You're no different than us. And Why would I want what you have? Why? The salt has lost its effectiveness. Yes, sir. Our attitudes. A simple attitude a bad attitude can cause us to lose our effectiveness. What has been built over years can be lost in seconds. The book of 2 Kings, we are introduced to a prophet. That prophet was sent to kings to promote the Word of God. And after some time of prophesying and being God's man to the kings of Israel... God said to this prophet, I need you to go to another country. I need you to go and witness against them too and call them to repentance. But that prophet said, I don't want to. I don't like them. I was hoping you would just burn the city down regardless. And God said, no, I want you to go. We know the man's name, Jonah. We know his story. Down into the belly of the whale. And as he's down in the belly of the whale, he cries out to the Lord. And after three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, he is spit out. I know the Old Testament says a great fish, but Jesus called it a whale, so I'll call it a whale too. Amen. Spit out on the, on, the, on the shore. And off he went. He runs into Nineveh. Repent! Repent! God's going to burn you down in 40 days. And I hope he does. Uh, 40 days is going to come and repent, repent. I hope he burns you all. Uh, that's, that's the way he came into town. And after he gets done preaching his message, he goes up to the hillside, finds a place, uh, sits out there and... Yep. Wait for the burn. Jonah, what you doing here? Waiting for you to burn him? Jonah. They've got a soul. I don't care. I don't care. I hope you burn them all. <laughs> Makes a little gourd come up over him to give him some shade. Next morning, there's a worm that eats the gourd or the, uh, the shade tree there, and it, it, all, it, it withers away. And now, he, and now the sun's beating down on his bald head, and he's, now he's really mad. Yeah. What you mad about, Jonah? Well, <laughs> That worm that ate, ate the tree here, that was, a, that was my shade. I, I'm, just, I'm just ticked off about that. You're upset about this, Jonah, and you're not concerned about the 600,000 people sitting down, or the 120,000 people sitting down there that doesn't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand? Do you not see the irony here, Jonah? I just want to see you burn them. Yeah. After that particular encounter... Jonah is never used to the Lord again. His attitude made him worthless. Let me ask you this. Is the liberty that you demand today worth the lost influence you may have down the road? Oh, all things may be lawful, but not everything is expedient. 
That's what the Apostle Paul said in Romans. Can I ask you something? You may be right. By the way, Jonah was right. The Assyrians did deserve to be burned. They did deserve to be destroyed. They were godless people. They did deserve judgment. But is it worth you being right for God to say, okay, but I can't use you anymore. You have become good for nothing. I'll set you on the shelf. I hope I never get there. I hope I don't let my words ruin my testimony. I hope my actions do not ruin my testimony. I hope my attitude will never take away my effectiveness for the Lord. Listen, there are some things worth just leaving alone because I'd rather be an effective tool in the hand of the Lord than to get my way. Ye are the salt of the earth. It's up to the Christians to preserve righteousness today. It's not up to the Republican Party. It's not up to the conservative party. It's not up to whatever leaning that you have that you think is, is right. It's not up to the anti-vaccination crowd or the pro-vaccination crowd. It's not up to those who are on this side or that side if you're on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. It doesn't matter. You know what matters? Are you being a Christian? We have traded in our Christianity for conservatism in our country today. And what we have found is this, is that we have lost our effectiveness for Christ in order for us to be right. There is no political party worth me giving my soul to in exchange for being able to be used for Him. Now, I'm not saying don't be involved in those things. I believe you should because it's up to Christians taking a stand for what is right. Not how does the party line up, but how does, how does the Bible line up? Well, we need to be careful and we need to be mindful that we are Christians first and then everything else falls in line. The world tells us to keep our religion in the church. God tells us to spread it everywhere we go. I read this from one man. He said, it'd be a sad thing if one day your neighbor stands before the Lord at the judgment seat and they know where you stood on the vaccine. They knew where you stood on every presidential election. They knew where you stood on every, every question of society, but they had no idea about Jesus Christ and that you were a Christian. I hope they know first and foremost, I'm a believer. I follow Jesus Christ. Everything else has its place, but let's make sure we are promoting the things of God. Yeah. Salt left in the shaker or in the package does no good. Salt doesn't need salt. It has to be out to be effective. So don't keep it to yourself. Preserve righteousness. Stand for what is right and be a purifier. Stay consistent in front of your friends, your family, your co-workers, so that you can penetrate that cold, hard heart and be a promoter of the old-time religion because God needs you. God needs you to be what you are supposed to be in this old lost world. Ye are the salt of the earth. God, help us this morning, I pray.